flood itself in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse number 9. So go ahead and turn there. And we're going to go through the flood verse by verse. Yes, we're looking at the four main events and we're looking at the four main characters. And so we're, in a sense, skipping a lot in the book of Genesis. But I also want you to know that when we get to those certain events, we want to go verse by verse. And we did that with creation, so we're actually going to do that with the flood. So look with me, if you would, in verse number 9. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Now, when we hear the term righteous, we think of something that this verse is actually not saying. You see, the word righteous is translated from the Hebrew word sadiq, which means to conform to a moral and ethical standard. In other words, what this is saying is that Noah recognized that God had a certain moral and ethical standard and he conformed to that standard. Now, this is not saying that Noah was sinless. But when we see the word righteous because we have this New Testament mentality, that's the first thing that we think of. It says that Noah was a righteous man. But Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that includes Noah. So this is not saying that Noah was sinless. It simply means that Noah did his best to live up to God's moral and ethical standard. It also says that Noah was blameless among the people of his time. And again, we have this New Testament mentality. And when we hear blameless, we think sinless. But remember the scripture says there is none righteous, no, not one. Except for who? Jesus. So when it says that Noah was blameless, what does he mean by that? Well, the word blameless is translated from the Hebrew word tamim, which means to have integrity and honor. So again, this is not saying that Noah was sinless. It's simply saying that Noah was a man of integrity and honor, especially when you compared him to all of the people around him. Everyone else was wicked. Everyone else was prone to violence. They had no honor. They had no integrity. There were no morals. But Noah had morals. He was a man of integrity and a man of honor. And the last part of verse number 9 says that Noah walked with God. This was the same thing that was said about Enoch in chapter 5, verse number 24. If you looked there, this is what you would see. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more. In other words, Enoch was snatched to heaven. Enoch was raptured. Every once in a while, I'll have a person come to me and say, you know, Pastor Allen, I don't believe in the rapture. First of all, there's no such word as rapture in the New Testament. I said, well, I'll be honest with you. There's no such English word that was ever in the original language. But there is the Greek word harpazo, which means to snatch. And that is the word that we get the word raptured from. So it's talking about being raptured. Well, Enoch walked with God and then he was snatched to heaven. In other words, he was raptured. So we see an example of someone being raptured. Now, Noah had the very same type of relationship with God. Just like Enoch, he walked with God. Which means that he had fellowship with God and he communed with God. And if you read the story closely, you you see that God specifically spoke to Noah seven times. And he spoke to him in great detail. So we know that Noah had a very intimate relationship with God. In fact, God spoke to him in Genesis chapter 6 verse 13, Genesis chapter 7 verse 1, chapter 8 verse 15, chapter 9 verse 1, 8, 12, and 17. So God specifically spoke to Noah at least seven times. Now let's move on to verse 10. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. This verse is basically a repetition of Genesis chapter 5, verse number 32. Its purpose is to serve as a bridge back to the genealogy of chapter 5, which was disrupted by the story of the sons of God having sex with the daughters of men and creating this super race of people known as the Nephilim. So look with me, if you would, at the book of Genesis chapter 5, verse number 32. It says, after Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So chapter 6, verse number 10 is a bridge back to the genealogy of chapter 5. Now let me explain what I mean by bridge. In Genesis chapter 5, verse number 32, it tells us that Noah was the father of Shem, Ham, 
and Japheth. And then, all of a sudden, he tells this story here about the sons of God having sex with the daughters of men. And then all of a sudden, he comes back here in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 10, and he tells us the very same thing he told us over here. Noah was the son of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, why does he do that? Because he's gotten off track. He had to take this little detour to explain how the world became so wicked. Why in the world did God have to judge the entire world? Now, let's be honest. This is extreme measures for God to destroy not only every human being with the exception of Noah and his family, but every living creature that had breath. But God had to do it. Why? And he wants to tell us why. It's because of this little story. But after he's told us that, we need to get back on track. We need to go back to where we were in Genesis chapter 5, verse number 32. And the best way to do that is to actually come in and repeat this over again. But another reason he repeats this over again is because he wants you to understand that God's redemptive plan is going to pass through the line of Noah. Everyone else is going to be wiped out. So everyone on the planet today can trace their genealogy back to Shem, Ham, or Japheth. Does that make sense? All right, move on to verses 11 and 12. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and it was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Now, if you noticed... He's being quite repetitive here. In fact, the Bible is kind of like us. We don't like to repeat a word over and over again because it shows that we have a limited vocabulary, right? So many times when you're writing a letter and you're wanting to say the same thing, you use synonyms. You use different words. And the Bible is a lot like that. But every once in a while, you'll find out that a certain word is used over and over and over again. And it's used for emphasis. And the word corrupt is used in this manner. We see it three times in these two verses, and it's a very interesting word. It's translated from the Hebrew word kaf, and it means to destroy, to ruin, or to devastate. So what these two verses are saying is that mankind has ruined the earth. They have destroyed what God has created. They have filled the earth with violence, and now God's plan to bring the seed of the woman is almost derailed. So God is going to have to step in or this promise is not not going to come to fruition. Now, what's interesting about this is God is going to tell us in verse number 13 that the people are going to reap the consequences. They are going to reap what they've sown. Look at verse 13. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Now, I want you to underline the word destroy. It's the very same Hebrew word that was translated as corrupt in verses 11 and 12. Shakaf. So basically, what he's saying is, they corrupted the world. I'm going to corrupt them. Now, we wouldn't say it like that. Basically, we didn't translate that right. Literally, what he's saying is, They destroyed the world. I'm going to destroy them. They've ruined the earth with their violence. They've destroyed everything around them. So I'm going to ruin the earth and destroy them. Now, after God told Noah that he was going to destroy all of the people in the earth, he then told Noah to build a huge barge-like structure called an ark. Now, this is kind of interesting because the Hebrew word that's normally used for ship or boat is not used. I won't go into what the word ark means. I'm hoping to do that next week. But what's interesting is the only time that this word ark is used is when it's referring to this and to the container that Moses was put in as a baby when they put him in the Nile River. That was also referred to as an ark. This is a different word than the ark of the covenant. But it's interesting because it's not referred to as a ship. Basically, he's telling Noah that he wants to build this huge barge-like structure to be used, in a sense, as a protective cover. 
Now, the purpose of the ark was to save Noah and his family and at least two of each of the animals. Now, this would have been a huge undertaking, and I'm sure, if you're thinking like I am, that this would have been overwhelming to Noah, except that God had given him specific instructions on how to build it. So all Noah had to do was basically follow God's instructions. Now, we don't get all of the specific instructions that God gave Noah, but we're going to get a general list of the instructions that he gave Noah. And what's interesting is, as we study this plan or this, this list of instructions on how to build the ark, we notice that it's not designed for speed. It's not even designed to be able to navigate it. There was no way to steer it. Noah was not the captain of the ship. The reason this is referred to an ark is because basically all it's supposed to do is just like the ark that baby Moses was put in and out to the river. He wasn't steering the ship. He wasn't trying to get it from point A to point B. The only purpose of this vehicle was to protect those inside. And so it was not designed to be able to navigate. Noah could not steer it. He was not the captain of the ship. It was designed for capacity and floating stability. Turn with me, if you would, to the book, to the verses uh, 14 and 16. Or 14 through 16. It says, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top. And set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Now, if you don't mind, we're going to go over the design of the ark. You're probably not that interested in it. But to me, it's interesting. I'm the type of person that believes that all of the good things are in the details. So if God ever gives us details, those are the things that I want to study. And, and so he gave us some details here. First of all, he told us that the ark was 300 cubits long. It was 50 cubits wide, and it was 30 cubits tall or high. Now, a cubit is approximately 18 inches. And I'm using the word approximately because in biblical times, a cubit was roughly the distance between a man's elbow and the end of his hand. So basically, if a man put his arm down, from his elbow to the end of his hand was a cubit. Now, as you might guess, this is going to vary from man to man. So... 18 inches actually became the standard length of a cubit. And what a man would do after they actually came to this point where they said, you know what, from now on a cubit is going to be 18 inches. And they came up to that, as I said, from measuring a man from the end of his elbow or from the tip of his elbow to the end of his hand. But because it varies, they said, well, we're going to have to come up with some type of standard, and it was 18 inches. So what men would do in biblical times is that they would take that standard and they would put their arm up to it. And like for me, my, my uh, arm, the length from the elbow to my ring finger is 18 inches. Not to my middle finger, not to my forefinger. So basically, I know if I want to measure that I just have to put my arm down and I measure from the tip of my elbow to my ring finger and that's 18 inches. Now, if you're a shorter person and maybe your arm is not as long, then you would put your arm down, that's, that standard or that cubit, and know that it's 18 inches, but you wouldn't have a, a Stanley measuring tape. So what you would do is you would figure out whether you need to put two fingers, a whole hand, maybe you turn your hand sideways, and that would be a cubit. But for me, 18 inches is from my elbow to my ring finger. But the point I'm trying to make is this. A cubit is basically 18 inches, a foot and a half. So the ark was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall, with three stories. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I kind of like to dig a little bit deeper. And I always like to know what the Jewish rabbis in Christ's day thought about certain things. And if you go and you dig a, bit, a little bit deeper, you'll find out that the Jewish rabbis in Jesus' day believed that the top story was for Noah and his family and the food. The middle deck was for the animals, and the bottom deck was for the refuse. Now, if you noticed, God told Noah to make rooms for the animals. Now, I don't know why, but sometimes we get to thinking that just for all these animals, and they just kind of wandered around on side, you know, and you had the giraffes with the elephants, and you had the lions with the tigers, and they just kind of intermingled. But that's not what the story says. God told Noah to make rooms. 
Now, the word rooms is translated from the Hebrew word cane, which literally means nest, like a bird's nest, but it's in the plural, so it's nest. So what this is saying that is that each room was specifically designed for the animal it was going to house. Two elephants would need a very large room, a very large nest, but a mole would only need a little dirt in a corner. So you don't have these symmetrical rooms all the same size. But no, God specifically told him, and we don't have the specific instructions, we have the general. But he was to make rooms, nest for each of the animals. But the size of the ark was more than adequate to house at least two of every animal on the planet with room to spare. And I want to show you that tonight. The total volumetric capacity of the ark was approximately 1,400,000 cubic feet which is equal to the volumetric capacity of 522 railroad stock cars, or box cars, if you like saying it that way. Now, does everyone know what I mean by volumetric? Volumetric is simply the measurement of something by volume. So instead of saying square feet, we're going to measure the volume of this. So what I'm telling you is this is equal to the volumetric capacity of 522 railroad stock cars. If you took a train, and I think this is right, I didn't write this down, and I think I read this, and Lisa will tell you, many times when I'm preparing and study, I might read as many as 27, 30, 35 books. I think I read that this would be a train that's four miles long of stock cars. Now, according to Henry Morris, there are about 18,000 species of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians living in the world today. Now, if you allowed for two of each species and five extra animals in each clean species, and we'll see why next week, and then you allowed for the various sizes. Remember, not all of the, the animals are the same size, so think about it. You would have large animals like elephants and giraffes, but even those are not going to be mature animals. They're probably going to be the young, small animals because they're going to spend over a year on the ark without reproductive activity. And then they're going to go out and repopulate the earth. So they were probably young animals, not the mature. So we're talking about starting off as baby elephants, a male and a female, that's going to grow over this year, but they're not the huge, big ones yet. And then, of course, you had naturally the small animals. You had things like the mice, the lizards, the frogs, etc. So the average size of all the animals would have been about the size of a sheep. So we can kind of think about that and we can say, okay, how many boxcars would it take to be able to take this many sheep? Well, that tells us that we only need about 150 railroad stock cars to hold all of the animals. And remember... The ark has the volumetric capacity equivalent to 522 railroad stock cars. So just the middle floor of the ark was large enough to hold two of every animal on the planet and five extra animals from every clean species. People, that's how large the ark was. Now, how many of you have received the email about the man over in Europe that has built an ark? And suppose he's built it to the specifications. Well, he didn't. If you notice and you look at it, it looks pretty narrow. And when he tells you what his dimensions are, it says 20 cubits. How would you have liked to have done a project like that and realized that you're off by 30 cubits? I mean, you finish this, you tell everyone that this is the size of it, and then you find out it's not. If you go back and look, he got the length right. He got the height right. He didn't get the width right. It's only about... The way he did it, 20 cubits is 30 feet, when actually it's 75 feet. And if you look at pictures, you can see what I'm talking about. And you'll actually see the dimensions that he puts on there. But this was an extremely large, and I don't want to say ship, an extremely large ark. It's not a ship. You don't steer it. You're not going from point A to point B. The only purpose of this vehicle is to ride out the flood. It's going to go wherever God wants it to go. Now, a ship this large 
would be exceedingly stable almost impossible to capsize. In fact, experts say that the ark could have been tilted at any angle just short of 90 degrees. And then it would have been able to immediately right itself. Now I want you to think about that. Here this is, and of course 90 degrees is that. Now it can't go to 90 degrees, right? Can't go all the way up and be perpendicular. But it said almost any degree up to 90 degrees come back down and immediately right itself because of the way that it was designed. Not only that, but it would have had the tendency to line itself parallel with the direction of the waves, so it would have been subject to minimum pitching. Now, that's kind of confusing the way I said it, because if the waves are coming in this way, what I'm saying is that the ship would have been perpendicular to the waves. And as a result of that, it would have rode out the waves very smoothly. It would have had very little pitching on there. God also instructed Noah to build a window one cubit high, all around the top of the ark. Now, if you're not careful, and you're reading through the story, you get the impression that he was told to make one little bitty window. And there's no windows in this thing except one little bitty window that's a cubit. And we think of it being 18 inches square. And that's the place where he opened up these wooden shutters and he let out the raven. Remember? And then he let out the dove. But people, that's not what this is saying at all. People, this wasn't one small window. People, this was more like a clear story. In fact, I want you to look at how the NIV translates this in, in verse 16 so that you're going to get a better mental image of the window system, what God said to make. Notice what it says in the NIV. It says, make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Are you catching what this is saying? It's saying that there was an opening 18 inches high all around the very top of the ark. It was all windows around it. And of course you had the bracing coming up. But it was open all the way around just like a clear story. Now the whole purpose of the window was to allow light into the upper floor. But also to allow fresh air in. Because after a year with these animals it could get pretty ripe. Do you understand what I'm saying? And trust me, it wasn't a pleasure cruise. They weren't on there saying, we're just going to enjoy this. Now, what we're going to find out next week, I hope, maybe in two weeks, is that many of the animals went into hibernation. Yeah. But we'll look at that later. But the most interesting thing about this is, you've got all these animals that's there. You've got this refuse that you're collecting in the bottom. You also have this food that's there. You need fresh air. And God designed this for everything looking ahead. Now here's a good picture of what the ark probably looked like. Go ahead and put that up there if you don't mind. In fact, I don't think it's as good as it could be. And the reason why is because they're putting the clear store just this small around it. But here's the roof that's on top of the ark. And then I want you to see, these are the windows that are a cubit high. But if you notice, this is unlike any ship you've ever seen. That's why it's not called a ship. It's called an ark. Its purpose is not to steer it anywhere. Its purpose is not to navigate it. The whole purpose is just to ride out the flood. That's it. We're going to live in this thing for over a year. Because everything else on the earth is going to be destroyed. Now if you notice... You've got three stories above it, and then you've got the roof and the windows that are above it to allow this fresh air in and light for the first story, but we don't want it to get down to the second story. And we'll look at why next week. Verse 17. I'm going to bring a flood on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Now, I want you to understand the Hebrew word that's being used for earth is land. So the marine animals are going to be able to survive. But everything that has breath in it, everything on land will perish. Now people, this is the very first time that God actually explains how he's going to destroy all of the inhabitants on the earth. You see, up until this time, all he's told us is, I'm going to destroy all of the inhabitants on the earth. And he tells Noah, you got 120 years, he's telling all of this. 
Of course, he's going to give them the details. But the interesting thing is, we don't know how he's going to do this until we get to this particular time. And then he tells us how he's going to do it. He's going to do it with a flood. Now, we're not talking about a localized flood. We're talking about a worldwide flood that covered the entire earth. Now, every once in a while, you'll turn on the TV to someplace like the Discovery Channel. And you'll have these supposedly biblical experts. You know what's kind of interesting to me? They're never experts. They're experts on what the secular world says, but they never really study the Bible. And what you'll find is these supposedly experts who are liberals talking about this being a localized flood. Well, if they studied the Bible, they would realize that that's not the case. This flood was worldwide. You see, the Hebrew word for flood in this verse is not the usual word for flood. In fact, the only time this Hebrew word is used is when it's specifically referring to the worldwide flood in Noah's time. It's the Hebrew word mabul, and as I said, it refers to the worldwide flood. Every other Hebrew word for flood refers to a flood in a localized area. This is the only one that doesn't. And people, it's the same holds true in the New Testament. Whenever the Genesis flood is referred to in the New Testament, a specific Greek word is used. And this is the only word that's used for it. It's the Greek word kataklusmos. Kataklusmos. Now, does that word sound familiar? It ought to. Cataclysm? Our English word cataclysm is derived from this word. It's actually transliterated from this word. But a cataclysmos refers to the worldwide flood in Noah's day as opposed to a local flood. Anytime the word flood is used that doesn't refer to this Genesis flood, a different Greek word is used. Why? Because God is making a distinction. Because when we start studying the covenant that God made with Noah, he made a promise that he would never again send a... Mabul. He will never again send a kataklusmos. But we do see floods. We see floods in Houston. We see floods in Tennessee. Sometimes we have flash floods. We just saw a flood in Afghanistan. We see these floods, but that does not break the promise of God. Because God did not say that, that localized floods would not come. God's promise is there would never again be a worldwide flood flood and that's why God said everything on the earth earth means land everything that has breath will perish look back at verse 17 I'm going to bring a flood mabul on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens every creature that has breath in it everything on land will perish and that's why there had to be at least two of every animal a male and a female because those males and female animals were going to repopulate the earth because every other animal, land animals, died. Now, there were those animals, marine animals, that could survive. But the Bible takes care of that. We see that. Verse 18. Okay, I lied. We're going to go a little longer. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark. You and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Now, this is the very first time that the word covenant is actually used in the Bible. But it's not the first covenant. It's the first time that the word covenant is used, but it's not the first covenant. In fact, God had a covenant agreement with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now, we didn't read that, did we? In fact, we studied the fall and nowhere did we find that God had a covenant with Adam, did we? So how do we know that God actually made a covenant with Adam? Well, believe it or not, we have to go forward instead of backwards. We don't go back to earlier chapters of Genesis to find this out, but we go forward to the book of Hosea. Now, if you don't know it, the book of Hosea is the first book in the Minor Prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. You can do that, right? Yes. Hosea is the first book of the minor prophets. But I want you to notice what he says in chapter 6, verse number 7. He says, but like Adam, Adam, you broke my covenant and betrayed my trust. God had a covenant with Adam, but Adam broke that covenant. 
when he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God made a covenant with Noah. And the details of that covenant are given in Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 17, which we won't have time to cover tonight. I don't know if we'll get to it next week, but we will in two weeks. Yes, we're going to finish the book of Genesis sometime. And trust me, we're going through this very quickly. But I don't want to miss the good stuff. So what God is going to do is he's going to establish a covenant. And he's going to give us a sign of the covenant. And we're going to look at that in two weeks. So look at verses 19 through 21. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Now I want you to notice, he's bringing them into the ark. This is not a ship. I know I keep repeating this. But we have the tendency to think of this as a ship or a boat. But God has used a unique word. All this is, is a life preserver. You're not going to steer it. You're not going to navigate it. You're not going to keep it off any reefs. None of that's going to happen. All you're going to do is ride this out. And anything within this ark. And we're going to find out why, hopefully in two weeks if I have time, why it's so important we're using this word ark. Everything inside of this will be preserved. And there's only one door to it. And God is the one that seals the door. And it's a picture of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. And a great judgment is coming. And only those within the ark are going to be saved. And this is a picture. And when we get to the Genesis genealogies, we're going to actually go backwards. And we're going to find out that even in the names... Most of you don't even know what the word Methuselah means. We say it all the time, you're as old as Methuselah. But we don't realize that from Adam, Adam lived over 900 and something years, and of course Methuselah lived 960. Do you realize that only two of those generations passed away before the flood occurred? Methuselah died right before the flood. The very year of the flood he died. In fact, Rabbis believe that Methuselah died seven days before God sent the flood. Hopefully I'll get to explain why next week. But I'll give you a little hint. Go and study what the word Methuselah means. That name has specific meaning. And most people don't even realize it. Anyways, I'm getting off track. Verses 19 through 21. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. Now I want you to notice that God didn't tell Noah, I want you to build this ark and then I want you and your sons to go on a safari. And I want you to capture two of every animal. No. He didn't say that. I want you to notice that God said, these animals will come to you. Look at verse 20 again. Did you see that? Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you. It says it that way in the King James Version, the New American Standard, the NIV, and the NLT. You want to know why it says it in all translations? Because that's what it says in the original Hebrew. God's telling him, you build the ark, I'll send the animals. People, that is so neat. Because God's going to do everything supernaturally. So when it was time for the flood, two of every animal on the earth, a male and a female, came to Noah. Now, of the clean species, we're going to find out that seven are going to come. That's not seven, is it? Seven are going to come. Three pairs and one for sacrifice. Because if you only have two and we get to the end of this journey and God comes in and, and, and now makes a covenant to Noah, Noah's going to offer a sacrifice. Well, if you kill the male or the female, we're never going to have that animal again. So we're going to find out that uh, resources are made for that. And we'll talk a little bit more about the animals next week. But for now, all I want you to see is that when it was time to board the ark, the animals came to Noah. He didn't have to go out and get them. And verse 21 tells us that Noah and his sons had gathered enough food for themselves and the animals and had stored it on the ark. And believe it or not, it wasn't as much food 
as you would think. And I'm going to explain why next week. Verse 22. Noah did everything God commanded him. Noah was not only a man of faith, but he was also obedient. And he did everything that God commanded him to do. In fact, not only did he do what God told him to do and built the ark, but Noah also preached to everyone who would listen. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5. It says, If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, now notice this, a preacher of righteousness and seven others. The truth is, had anyone listened to Noah and repented, they would have been granted access to the ark. And they would have been saved also. And there was more than enough room for them. Now let me give you a principle about God. I believe that heaven is going to be bigger than we need. In fact, when we were going through the book of Revelation and we looked at the New Jerusalem, do you remember how many miles high it was? We took, would you say it's an atlas or a map of America? And, and I showed you that as big as the New Jerusalem is going to be, it's from the border of Canada all the way to the border of Mexico. It's from the Pacific Ocean almost all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, about the size of America. But not only that, it's a cube. So when you do the miles, how many miles that is, and think about how many miles it is from Canada to Mexico. That's how high it is. I don't know how many stories there are, but trust me, there's more than enough room for every Christian who's ever lived, plus some. And you want to know why? Because it's a forever testimony to God's grace and his mercy and his desire that everyone should repent. People, I don't care what you've heard from Calvinists. That God predestined some to heaven, but he predestines others to hell. That Jesus didn't die for everyone. That is a lie straight from hell. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. But they all come into repentance. And I want you to understand that the reason the ark was so large is because it's a, it's a forever testimony to the fact that God wanted more to be on that ark than what was there. And it's the same way with us. There is going to come a day of judgment. And the only ones that's going to be protected are those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ will receive no condemnation. Those who are not in Christ will be condemned. But God is not willing that any should perish. And I promise you, heaven has enough room for everyone who's ever existed to be there. And I guarantee you, even though God knows everyone's not going to be there, he still made enough room for them all. Now, of course... The ark wasn't that big, but it had enough room that if people would have listened and repented and, and, and come to the fact of what God had said, they could have entered into the ark. And that's what I want you to understand.